So, um, last time I was talking about um, hyperliptic curves, and we're basically done with that. Curves. But I did want to say just a few more words about the um, one very pretty application of what we discussed. So remember that we had a family of curves uh, which were given by y, x, y, such that y squared equals e of x, which I could fix to be x minus rho sin i from the n. And then I fixed all my uh, freedom if I've taken uh, n to be odd and i to be uh, rho, rho 0 is 0 and rho 1 is 1. Otherwise, it's just a family. That's not so important. The important thing was that um, these rows were living in a configuration space points of C, which had uh, non-zero pi 1, which was the braid group. And to every um, surface, there is canonically associated to it a lattice, homology lattice. And so that means that over this space, over C sub n of C, we have what's called a local system, called lambda, whose fiber of a row is exactly the homology. So this is some lattice, and uh, and then I demonstrated at the end that uh, it has monodromy. So remember, we have a um, we have a, a canonical lifting of curves. So if I have a closed curve in here, that lifts, and we can have a monodromy. And I pointed out that if we are near a place where our surface is degenerating, because some cycle has shrunk to a point, so supposing this cycle here is pinching to a point, Let's call that, uh, that homology cycle V for vanishing. Then the um, then the formula for the uh, then then this is associated with two two zeros of P colliding with each other. And if you go around that point, those are the basic braidings in the braid group then the general cycle transforms by gamma goes to gamma plus gamma-oriented intersection product with V times V. So that's what I said last time. Now, as I was just beginning to explain, one of the very beautiful applications of this is to n equals 2 uh, gauge theories. So this was discovered in uh, 1994 by Seibert and Witten, and there's a lot of physics background that I'm not going to be able to explain right now. But um, I just want to indicate a, a few aspects here. So what they pointed out was that, first of all, these theories have uh, a large space of vacua. And, um, and the physics, really, the vacuum physics, the spectra of the Hamiltonian and of certain particles, really depends on where you are in the space of vacua. And what they proposed was that over the space of vacua, uh, so if we have some point, uh, let's call it U, in the space of vacua, we have a Riemann surface, sigma U. And moreover, we can attach to that its first homology, which is a lattice. And this turns out to have the interpretation A 
H1 of sigma u and z has the interpretation of a lattice of electric and magnetic charges. And moreover, um, particles are associated with homology classes on sigma u. Now, it's not true that every homology class corresponds to some particle. And that's actually a topic of current research, is to figure out uh, which homology classes correspond to particles and not. So I thought I would illustrate this. Oh, and one more thing. This, um, this Riemann surface comes equipped with a uh, differential one form, which is meromorphic. It can have poles. And the reason you introduce this is that when a homology class gamma corresponds to a particle, its mass is given exactly by the period of um, the period of this lambda around that, that curve that corresponds to that particle. So let me just show you a little of how that how that looks for the uh, first case, the case that Seiberg and Wheeler Witten really figured out, which is SU2 gauge theory. so-called no matter. Um, so then the curve is one of these hyperelliptic curves that we've been discussing. So this U is the vacuum expectation value of some scalar field in the theory. And that vacuum expectation value breaks, spontaneously breaks SU2 down to U1. So at low energies we have U1, and that's where you get the electric and magnetic charges. And the lambda has to do with a dynamically generated scale in the theory. So I won't say too much about that. So the other important piece of data that you need to provide here is this differential form lambda. And um, it's, let's forget about this normalization, it's just x squared dx over y. Now remember I showed earlier that uh, on this curve, if I look at the differential form, omega equals dx over y, even though y can vanish, it vanishes at the roots of this polynomial, nevertheless, this differential form is well defined. Okay, so that's, that's the formula. And so let's, let's uh, take this as a good physical motivation and really understand this local system as a function on the u plane. So let's now find uh, where are the branch points. So remember the branch points are the zeros of this, right? So you can, you can uh, see what the zeros are in real time, I think. So I'm going to label them. E1 is minus square root of u plus lambda squared. E2 is minus the square root of u minus lambda squared. E3 is the square root of u minus lambda squared. And E4 equals the square root of u plus lambda squared. Now, the presence of square roots here should alert you to the fact that there's going to be trouble, um, right? You, that means that, well, we know that this U-plane is not going to be simply connected just the way um, this uh, configuration space in general was not simply connected. So, now in the X-plane, it's always easy to get confused between the U-plane and the X-plane. Um, let's... Let's see, let's use uh, orange for our branch point. So the x-plane, when u is large and positive, will have branch points like that. So let's say this is uh, e1, e2, e3, and e4. And um, it's up to me to make a choice of cuts. So I'm going to make a choice of cuts like this. And then as we've seen, we get a canonical homology basis. So let's draw that in. So here's our A cycle. And here's our 
B cycle. Okay. And from what we said before, we know that what this thing is, is a torus with two punctures. Those are the two points that I would add at infinity if I were to compactify this curved signal. Okay. So now, where does the curve become singular? Well, remember, the curve becomes singular when two branch points collide. Okay? Then some cycles pinch. Now, it's clear that as u goes to uh, lambda squared, you see E2 and E3 go to zero. So E2 collapses to E3. And then the vanishing cycle is equal to the B cycle. OK? Now, you could ask, where are, what is the vanishing cycle for u equals minus lambda squared. Well, here you actually need to take a bit of uh, care. <coughs> so let's make a plot of the u plane here. So this is the picture of the cycles for large real u, say out here. Here's lambda squared. There's one singularity here. Here's minus lambda squared. There's another singularity here. And I need to pull these singularities out. That's why the moduli space of, that's why the parameter space of these elliptic curves is not simply connected. Things are singular there, and I need to excise these points. And when I do that, I have a non simply connected U plane. So, Really, when I said we have this, I was thinking of going down this way. Now, let me choose, this is a choice, but let me choose to approach um, minus lambda squared by doing that. Okay? So I'm going to sneak up on it from the left. Now, so let's, let's call this... Uh, P initial, and this, say, P final as I approach this. And so now I let you think through what happens to these uh, branch points. And so it's useful in doing so to uh, think of U as, as large in absolute value. So this becomes uh, lambda squared over 2 square root of U, and so on, minus the square root of U plus lambda squared over 2 square root of u. And so you see, as I rotate u, um, this is going to, these are going to rotate uh, by uh, pi over 4, sorry, pi over 2, because the phase of u is going by pi. And so what you'll find is that these branch points here evolve into a picture now, back in the x-plane now, a uh, picture like this. So let's see, I need green. Okay. So I'm going to have E2, E1, E4, and E3 with a cut like so. Okay. And now as lambda, uh, as U goes to minus lambda squared, these two points are approaching the origin. And it's quite clear that the vanishing cycle here, let me give it a different color. The vanishing cycle here is going to be this one. Okay, so let's call that the vanishing cycle. Okay? 
But that's not terribly useful. Uh, my first vanishing cycle was clearly understood out here. If I, I understood that if I started uh, with the basis A, B here and went to the singular point here, then there was a clear vanishing cycle, the B one. But I had to do this crazy manipulation of going over here to see clearly what the vanishing cycle was. So now, again, an exercise I leave to you is to take this curve and go back. So what's going to happen, these are going to rotate like this, these are going to rotate like that. And if you do that exercise, what you'll find is the following picture. Maybe I'll draw it. I'll draw it. I'll draw it over here, where we have our A and B cycles also marked. So what happens is you get a curve that looks like this. Okay. Like so. And now you can go and calculate the, um, <coughs> the intersection products with the A and the B cycles, and you discover that the vanishing cycle is V equals 2A plus B, if you transport it back to P. Now we can calculate the Lefschetz monodromy. We figured out what happens uh, what the what the monodromy is when we um, take a, a, a small detour around here and come back, and now if we take a detour around here and come back, I think I'm doing it in the counterclockwise motion. What we find is that m lambda squared, that's the monodromy for going around lambda squared, is one one zero one, by which I mean a goes to a plus b and B goes to B, whereas the monodromy around minus lambda squared is uh, 3, 1, minus 4, minus 1. That's obtained by uh, computing gamma goes to gamma plus gamma intersect V, V, with that V, and, um, okay, so it offset. So now I've got my full local system. You see, there are only two singular points here. So, so pi 1 of this punctured U-plane is just equal to, um, it's just equal to, I think, the free group. Yeah, it's, uh, you see, there's also a monodromy at infinity. So we should think of this as pi 1 of CP1 minus infinity lambda squared and minus lambda squared. And so that's the free group on three elements, or if you like, in terms of what we said last time, there should be three cycles. Gamma, these are cycles on the, on, the, on, the, on the moduli space, not on the curve. So what shall I call them? Um, I, I called them gamma last time, so I'm going to call them gamma this time. Gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, or, or better, here. Gamma lambda squared, gamma minus lambda squared, gamma infinity, such that their product, gamma lambda squared, gamma minus lambda squared, gamma infinity, is equal to 1. Okay. So that means we can just calculate the monodromy of infinity by taking a suitable product here. So the monodromy of infinity is the product 3, 1, minus 4, minus 1, which is minus 1, 0, minus 4, minus 1. Okay, what I'm saying is that um, if I want to calculate now the monodromy of going all the way around infinity, I can do that because I, I can say, well, I go around here and come back, and then I go around here and come back. And then that product of curves is in homotopy is the same as going all the way around. Okay. So what's the vanishing cycle for infinity? Um, there isn't a vanishing cycle for infinity because um, 
because, uh, well, let's see. So first of all, this lambda has a pole at infinity. And you could ask, what, how does the curve degenerate as u goes to infinity? And what's happening is two curves are pinching, but then also approaching each other. So the curve is becoming a little singular. But I don't need to know it. I mean, all I need to know is the monodromies around the lambda squared and minus lambda squared because of the simple structure of the space that's parametrizing this particular family of curves. You would see here. Uh, can you read off the vanishing cycle from this matrix? I mean, think it can be like this. Um, no, you see, this is naturally not of left shots type because of these minus ones. Uh, so infinity is a lot rather trickier. Now let's just ch uh, let's just get a reality check here. So let's see. We can actually verify very explicitly um, that this is the monodromy. It's a calculation worth doing. So let's let's actually try and calculate these periods. So we want to do the integral of x squared dx uh, over y around an a cycle. And this fills in something where I was rather too quick uh, a lecture and a half ago. So we want to integrate this x squared dx over y around this a cycle. Okay. Now this is a picture on the x plane. Of course, the actual surface, the Riemann surface, is a double cover. Now, because I'm surrounding two branch points, this, this uh, nicely pulls back to two, two closed curves up on the, on the cover, and I have to choose one, and I choose one by choosing a, a branch of y, one of the signs of the square roots of y. Now, by Cauchy's theorem, I can also shrink this down, this green curve down, to be right on the cut there, and of course the contribution of the cut over there is exactly equal and opposite to the contribution down there because I've just switched the sign and I've switched the direction which I'm integrating. And so if I put all those remarks together, then uh, this is equal to minus 2i times the integral from minus the square root of u plus lambda squared uh, minus the square root of u minus lambda squared of x squared dx over the square root of lambda to the fourth minus x squared minus u squared. And now here I've got something positive under the square root. And so I understand the square root to be the principal branch of the logarithm. So I take the positive real number, uh, which is that square root. <coughs> okay. Some steps for you to fill in there. Now I could say, well, it's just an integral, and now you do it. It's actually a rather subtle function. Um, it's uh, an example of an elliptic function with a change of small change of variables that I tell you in the notes. You can turn it into uh, this integral, 1 plus lambda squared over u sine theta to the 1 half d theta by an elementary uh, change of variables. And uh, now you see this is a good way to write things because now I don't have a u dependence in the, bound, in the, in the uh, limits of the integral, which are always a little confusing. And I can, this is, has a very nice expansion at large u. Okay. Um, the sine isn't doing anything singular, so I could just expand this and get a power series in lambda squared over u. And so this clearly has the form um, uh, pi times 1 plus some expansion a n lambda squared over u to the nth power. So n equals 1 to infinity. All right. Um, well, that at least partially confirms what we said. We see we have a minus 1 here. So that u to the 1 half is uh, is good. Now, I should stress that I'm doing this for u large and positive. Or this is valid if 0 is less than or equal to lambda squared is less than u. OK. Uh, what about the B cycle? Same, same story. So uh, to do the B cycle, uh, 
dx over y around the b cycle, that's equal to minus 2. Now, you see I can pull this purple curve to an integral from here to here. I have to be careful about my choices of branches. I'll let you think that through. And you get uh, minus u minus lambda squared to u minus lambda squared x squared dx over again lambda to the fourth minus x squared minus u squared. Ah, that's wrong. And there's a mistake in the notes. See, how do I know that's wrong? I just copied and pasted paste in tech without thinking. Um, you see, how do I know that's wrong? Well, because I've re I wanted to reduce things to a positive number so that I have a branch, I can use the principal branch of the logarithm here. Now, when I'm between E2 and E3, which is what's true for the uh, B cycle, you see um, I have uh, x squared is less than um, u minus lambda squared, right? So that means that x squared minus u is less than minus lambda squared is less than zero. So that means if this is a bigger, this is bigger in absolute value. So x squared minus u squared is greater than lambda to the fourth. So, um, so it should have been like that. That's just a mistake in the notes. Okay, but I can be pretty confident that, um, I mean, that's what I actually did when I calculated, when I checked it, I just copied and pasted and did the thing. The next step is correct. So by a change of variables, which you can find in the notes, um, we have, we can write it this way. So we get another so-called elliptic function, where um, this theta naught, okay, maybe I'll tell you what this the change of variables was in this case, because I want to tell you what theta naught is. So where will I put it? I can squeeze it in down here. So the change of variables is x equals the square root of u, 1 minus lambda squared over u, cosh theta, uh, to the 1 half. And so theta naught is cosh theta naught is equal to u over lambda squared. Okay? All right, so that's, that's important because now once again, this is a compact integral and I can, I can uh, I, it's a little more subtle because there's something interesting in the, in the uh, range of the integration, but still I could expand here and get a power series. But you see the leading term gives me theta naught. Cosh theta naught is u over lambda squared and therefore theta naught, the large u, is like log u over lambda squared. Okay, so this is equal to minus, this log is extremely important, uh, is minus 2 to the, u to the 1 half log of 2u over lambda squared. And then we get another uh, series, 1 plus bn uh, lambda squared over u to the n, sum n equals 1 to infinity. Right up. So, uh, now you see rather beautifully that... Um, that we, confer we can confirm this monodromy. We already found the minus 1 here. Now, we get a minus 1 indeed from the u to the 1 half, but what's really important is this logarithm, which you see as u goes around, uh, as, as I bring the phase of u around by 2 pi, the logarithm shifts by u to the 1 half, and in fact it shifts, you can see, even the minus 4. Um, and it shifts exactly by this period here. So, um, so we, this is, we, now I've really constructed our local system and actually told you something about um, the periods. I said before that periods are in general not zero, but I didn't actually show you one, and so now I've shown you two. Um, just a little bit about the physics. These leading terms turn out to be uh, 
due to tree level and one loop effects, this logarithm comes from a one loop, uh, one loop Feynman diagram. And then all these corrections here, which as you see are in principle known exactly from these integrals, are the effects of instantons in this SU2 gauge theory. Moreover, this A period vanishes, I said it was a vanishing cycle, so it vanishes when we analytically continue in the U-plane to this point here, and it turns out that that cycle is a populated cycle. I, did, I said before that not all cycles, not all closed curves on the zyberg witten curve correspond to particles. That's, that's a, a, an intense topic of current research to say exactly which curves really, so really correspond to particles. In, in this case, it's known that um, these vanishing cycles, both of these vanishing cycles, do indeed correspond to particles in the theory, and in fact they're magnetic monopoles, and so this leads to the famous, uh, famous story that uh, when you take the U down here, these series uh, fall apart, when U approaches lambda squared, these don't, these don't converge anymore. The uh, quantum effects are very, very strong. Um, instantons become very important. And what happens is your monopole becomes massless, and that turns out to be a signal of confinement. OK, enough said about all that. Well, not enough said about all that, but this was just a uh, uh, little detour. Now I want to get back to more of our mainstream theme. Uh, <coughs> and I want to use our knowledge now of, now we know, we know all about bundles with discrete structure group. And we've seen that, well, at least when we have a discrete structure group, there is a unique way of lifting paths once you've, you've chosen a point in the fiber. And as I mentioned before, that's a connection. So for a discrete bundle, um, for a discrete structure group, your bundle comes with a canonical connection, and therefore we're all set up to talk about Yang-Mills theory, at least Yang-Mills theory in the case of a uh, discrete gauge group. So I want to go over that gauge theory with a discrete gauge group. And I want to stress that although I'm doing this now because um, I can, because there's a canonical connection when there's a discrete gauge group, uh, much of what I'm going to say applies equally well to the generic gauge theory with a compact gauge group. Okay? Uh, now, uh, yeah, I should say finite. Gauge theories with non-compact gauge groups are, um, in general, not unitary and is, are, are more complicated things to deal with. So, my gauge group is going to be discrete and compact and therefore finite. <coughs> But as I just said, um, a lot of the picture that I'm going to tell you right now applies to general gauge theories. Now, you might think this is a very toy example, but I think I, think I find it very clarifying on the one hand. And on the other hand, it really does arise even in, quote, more realistic theories. For example, uh, supposing I have uh, a charged scalar field phi in a U1 gauge theory. Okay, so the, the gauge group is U1, it's certainly not a finite group. So how could this be relevant? Well, it could be relevant if phi has charge N and develops a vacuum expectation value. Because then you see, what's the unbroken gauge symmetry? 
Well, uh, phi under gauge symmetry goes to the e to the i n theta phi, because phi has charge n, and uh, that's equal to phi if theta is 2 pi j over n. In other words, if I have a scalar field in a U1 gauge theory, and it has a charge which is some multiple n of the fundamental charge, then um, the gauge symmetry has spontaneously broken down to Zn. But this Zn is still a gauge symmetry. You see, it didn't stop being a gauge symmetry just because my Higgs field didn't break it. <laughs> okay? So that means that at low energies, I'm going to have a theory with a discrete gauge group, with a finite gauge group, Zn. Okay, and that actually happens in nature with n equals 2 because the thing that condenses in superconductivity is a Cooper pair, which is charged twice the fundamental electric charge. So, okay, so in superconductivity we in fact have a, uh, an example of this. And more generally, if, um, if uh, I have a theory with a, a continuous gauge group, but some Higgs fields break it down to a uh, finite subgroup, then at low energies I will have a theory with, the effective theory will be a gauge theory with a finite gauge group. Okay, so I hope all that is enough motivation for you to uh, pay attention. Okay, so, so uh, one little um, reminder before we get into this, into the discussion. I want to remind you about groupoids. So a groupoid is a category all of whose morphisms are invertible. And that, um, these, that turns out to be a very, very good language, very useful language when discussing gauge theories. And the following construction uh, uh, occurs quite a lot. Suppose uh, a group G acts on a manifold M, then we can canonically form a groupoid, which implies that there's a canonical or natural groupoid which is denoted as m slash slash g. And the uh, objects are to be thought of as the points in m, and the morphisms are arrows that look like this. We have a point in m, we have an arrow labeled by a group g, taking it to another point, which is the group action on the manifold. So you see that um, this, this is a category, right? Because if I have G1 and G2, then uh, the rules of a category says I should be able to compose these arrows and get another arrow to G2, G1M. Uh, and indeed, that's true because it is a group action on a manifold. All right. <coughs> And the, um, the automorphism group of any object, that's the group of morphisms from the object to itself, that's equal to the isotropy group of G at M. <clears throat> so, uh, two examples. Supposing that M is a point, okay? So a group acts on a point, it just takes the point to the point. And so we get point slash slash G, okay? So the picture is we have, a, we have a point, and then we have all these group operations taking the point to itself. But the interesting structure here is how they compose. And I've explained to you, I think, on previous occasions, that you can think of a group as a category with one, as a groupoid with uh, one object. A category with one object, all of whose morphisms are in 
convertible. Uh, so that's that's the uh, that's the category model of a group. And now example two, which is what we're going to use, is um, suppose that uh, G acts on itself by conjugation. Okay. So then we have G slash slash G, and so the objects, okay, are the points in G. And the isomorphism class of objects are the conjugacy classes in G. And uh, the um, automorphism of an object, of a, of a group element G, is the centralizer of that group element. So, in fact, let's, let's draw it for um, the case of uh, G equals the symmetric group on three letters. So then I'll have uh, at the object one the identity of the, um, of the symmetric group. So we're acting by conjugation, right? So uh, G takes H, say, to G, H, or G inverse H, G. Okay? So that means everybody just takes one to one. So one takes one to one. So these might be the morphisms labeled by the by the three cycles, and then I have three transpositions. So, then I have another isomorphism class of objects, and these are, of course, the uh, transpositions themselves. Uh, let's see, one, two, one, three, two, three. And now these are obtained one from another by conjugation. And um, here, there are two objects, of course, the identity always takes one, uh, one three to itself, and one three takes one three to itself, and similarly, uh, two point two. Yeah. Okay, so that's that. And then um, there are two other objects, the uh, cycles, one, two, three, and one, three, two. And um, there are morphisms for the various transpositions, okay, so 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 3, will conjugate the two cycles into each other, and then conjugating by a cycle um, doesn't, doesn't change the object. So that is a picture, that is a picture, this is a picture of that groupoid, G mod G, for the case of G equals uh, the permutation group of three letters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is there any you know, illuminating way to see homogeneous spaces as particular case of group right? Uh They are absolutely. Uh, the homogeneous space is the space of isomorphism classes of a group point. That's exactly correct. Um, and this is an extremely good point of view to have when there are fixed points of your action. When, for example, your homogeneous space has orbifold singularities. Because, you see, that's what these, that's what these things are all about. When you have several automorphisms of, of an object, these self-automorphisms, these self-symmetries of, of an object have to do with fixed points. And so, lots of things that don't work well if you try and interpret M mod G as, as, a, um, as a manifold, because it's not a manifold, it has some singularity. If you instead use this language of group points, then things start uh, moving very smoothly. So it's really a good language for gauge theory, although, of course, very few physicists speak that language. But, um, well, in 20 years or so, they will. Okay, so okay, so now let's let's talk about gauging asymmetry. So supposing we have a d-dimensional field theory. Um, quick question. Yes. Um, what would correspond to fixing the gauge? Um, yeah. Let's let's come to that 
Uh, let me try and remember to answer that at the appropriate point. That's a, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, and it will come up naturally in the discussion. So supposing I have a d-dimensional field theory. So let's remember how we're thinking about that. We had um, S, which was some cobordism category of uh, d manifolds. Um, so that meant we had d minus one dimensional spaces, which I think I was denoting y at the beginning of the semester. And so then we had initial space ta uh, spaces and final spaces joined by some space time. Okay. So um, the space times were the cobordisms between the initial and final spaces, and uh, that, that forms a category. And then we had a, a field theory was a functor from this S into the category of vector spaces. So that language saying that that's a functor, I remind you, meant all sorts of things. These were tensor categories, first of all. And so um, it meant that uh, to every Y, we associate, I guess formally I would call it A, F of Y. I'll write it H of Y, the space of states. And um, when I have a, a, a cobordism, a space-time, then a Feynman diagram, the, the, sorry, the Feynman path integral should be thought of as defining a, um, a transition amplitude which goes from the initial to the final state space and that glues in the, in the, uh, in the uh, physical way and that's what it meant to be a function. Okay. So we're thinking of a space-time in those terms. Now, we say that G is a global symmetry of our field theory if, first of all, for all spaces Y, H of Y is a G representation. Okay. So it's a representation of the, of the group G. And secondly, uh, for all cobordisms, x from y0 to y1, the so-called the uh, transition amplitude, f of x, which goes from the initial state space to the final state space, um, is an intertwiner. Okay, that is, it commutes with the G action. Okay. Any questions about that? That should look, look like a good example of a definition of a symmetry. Now remember the cobordism Y times zero T, which goes just from H of Y to H of Y, corresponded to propagation by E to the minus T times the Hamiltonian. So this is e to the minus t times the Hamiltonian. So this property of being an intertwiner means that if I take a g action here, then this diagram must commute. So I could, for example, take uh, the uh, time goes to zero limit. And so this implies that my Hamiltonian commutes with g. Okay, which is something that you certainly recognize from standard definitions of what a global symmetry should be. Here, Hamiltonian should commute with the G. Okay, so let's, let's give a simple little example. Um, supposing we have a, a nonlinear sigma model. Okay, so that's a theory of, of where your fields are the maps from X into M. M is your target space. And now, remember to write the nonlinear sigma model action. You have to choose a, a metric of M, X. Uh, suppose that M has an isometry group for that metric, G. 
then the sigma model will have an, uh, a symmetry group, G. You see, we certainly have a map on the space of fields. G takes phi to phi upper G, where phi upper G at X is equal to phi of G, uh, sorry, phi of X, then let's say it's a right action of G on M. And uh, what's, the Hilbert, what's the Hilbert space? Well, morally speaking, the Hilbert space of Y is something like uh, wave functionals of these fields uh, where they're L2 in, in, in at least some moral sense. So we're in, we would integrate over maps from Y to M with some measure on the space of fields of psi of phi of Y absolute squared and we'd ask that that be finite. So <coughs> Now, there's all sorts of functional analysis here that I'm just skating on, which we're not going to go into. And then the g-action on the Hilbert space of states would say that uh, g inverse dot psi is the new wave functional whose value at phi is psi of phi g. So. And the reason I want an isometry, if you work this out further, is that I need it to be an isometry to commute, say, with the Hamiltonian. And also I want it to commute with the transition amplitudes. So I need this to... Yeah. So in this sense, the for example, the Lorentz symmetry is not And because you choose a time slice, somehow, for example, the boost does not act on Yeah, that's an interesting remark. I mean, I'm, I, have, I'm, I have in mind uh, internal symmetry, as I said, global okay. symmetry, the kind of thing I'm thinking about gauging. Um, but I dare say Lorentz symmetry could be incorporated. If this is a decent model of uh, what we think physics, uh, you know, field theory should be, then um, uh, Lorentz symmetry should be incorporated and I'm not going to try and figure it out right now on my feet. But um, yeah, I had a, I was thinking of internal symmetries, and um, it's a good remark. Um, I'm going to resist the temptation to try and figure it out right now. Okay, so um, so when we have a, a G symmetry in this sense, um, we can now gauge the symmetry. And so that means, that's a two-step process. So what it means is, first, you form an equivariant theory. Okay, by, what you do is you enlarge the space of fields. By including bundles with connection over space times x and spaces y. And I want to encourage you to think of the choice of a G bundle as a discrete kind of field. So it's a kind of extended uh, notion of what people usually use by field. And then, step two, is we sum or integrate over uh, gauge fields, that is, G bundles with connections. G bundles. So let's first talk about step one, and then talk about step two. So how do we form this equivariant theory? So now I'm just going to say what I just said again in more precise terms. So what I do is I have to enlarge my geometric category S to what I'll call S sub G. And 
then S of G has as objects are G bundles with connection over spaces Y. And the morphisms are, um, are G bundles with connection. Uh, G bundles, let me just write, P over X, which restrict to P naught over Y naught and P1 over Y1. In other words, a cobordism of G bundles. Now again, we haven't talked about connections uh, in, we haven't formally talked about connections except in some examples where I relied on your, your knowledge about, um, about gauge theory. But um, as it's usually taught in, in quantum field theory textbooks. But, um, but again, let me remind you that for a discrete group, uh, a bundle has a canonical connection. So there's only one connection once I've chosen the bundle. So, to draw a picture, my morphism is an X together with a G bundle over it that restricts to y in, it, y in and Y out, and that restricts to a G bundle, or I should call it P, whose fibers are G torsors, so then it restricts to a P1 and a P0. So imagine that I have a cobordism from Y in to Y out, okay, and I have a G bundle over that cobordism. Well, of course, if I restrict to the Y in, I get a G bundle over Y in, I get a G bundle over Y out. Okay, now there's an important complication here, which is, remember that uh, G bundles over X or Y in any space, form a groupoid. They form a groupoid where the morphisms are bundle, iso uh, bundle isomorphisms. So actually, you see, when I, when I enlarge this uh, category, this cobordism category, S to S sub G, I'm really, there, there are two kinds of morphisms in this geometric category. There's the cobordisms extended in the natural way, but then there are also bundle isomorphisms, maps between, bundle maps between two principal bundles, which are isomorphisms. Now, um, another remark is that we can regard S as a um, subcategory of SG, because if you see, if we have, uh, say, a, a cobordism X, we can take it to the trivial bundle, okay, X times G. And similarly, if we have a space Y, we can take it to the trivial G bundle, okay? So we can think... So that's why I'm saying we're enlarging our space here. This is really a sub subcategory of, of the set of all G bundles because to X there's canonically associated the trivial G bundle over X. Okay. Now, supposing we have a, uh, a theory with a global symmetry, then um, the equivariant theory then is a functor, let's call it F equivariant from this enhanced geometric category to the space of vector spaces. So what does that mean? Let's spell out what that means. That means if we have a principal bundle over our in or out spaces, then 
part of the specification of the gauging is that I'm telling you that there's a space of states associated with that. Okay? And now it has to be compatible with what we started out with. Okay, so um, if we take the space of states in the equivariant theory for the bundle P equals Y times G, then this should be equal to the space of states of the original theory we had. And now, you see, uh, P equals Y times G has, as group of automorphisms, just G. Namely, Y, G goes to Y, G naught dot G. You see, that is, is a bundle automorphism. for all G0 and G. Okay. So, we have these uh, bundle automorphisms that act on this space, and so part of being a functor means that they must act on the Hilbert space. So, these automorphisms act as the G representation we started with. Okay? So you see, we started with a theory with a global symmetry. So for all spaces Y, H of Y is a G representation. Now we're gauging that theory. So in the equivariant theory, we should get a space of states for every G bundle over Y. In particular, if we take the trivial G bundle over Y, we've just got the original space of states, and the trivial bundle, uh, G bundle over Y, has as group of automorphisms our group G, and therefore that group of automorphisms must act on this space, and um, that action must be the original G action we started with. Sorry, uh, yeah, why is why the automorphism of the Y time? Some, some NEP to act on it. Right, because I'm, I'm trying to make a functor here. Okay? So, in, in, so what, have, what have I got? I've got objects here. Okay? Going to objects here. Now, the objects have automorphisms. Those must map to automorphisms here. That means just by saying that I have a functor means that, in general, Automorphisms of P acts on H equivariant of P. Okay, I think maybe I should have said that first. Okay, if I've got a functor, what it means is that if my object here has some automorphism, okay, what does a functor do? It takes points to points and arrows to arrows. What does a point mean here? A point means a bundle. An arrow means an automorphism. A point here means a vector space, the space of states. An arrow means a linear transformation. So in general, the automorphism group must act on the space of states. Now, um, now I need to have compatibility with the theory that I started with, the ungauged theory. And that compatibility is this statement here. And uh, similarly, similarly, if I have if I have a morphism, so supposing I have some some x, some space time going from my initial space to my final space, and now I'm in this enhanced category, so I have some let's call it p tilde over this uh, cobordism X, which is restricting to a P initial and a P final. Okay. So what does, what does uh, having a functor mean? It means that we have H equivariant of P naught, let me just write, no, P naught to Y naught, 
And we get a linear transformation. That's F equivariant of this P tilde. It goes from here to here. P1 and Y1. So when I have uh, a bundle over space-time, restricting to initial and final bundles, then I have a transition amplitude. And um, what else do I want to say about that? Yeah, compatibility with the original theory means that if I take the particular case where P tilde equals X times G, then that, of course, restricts to the trivial bundle at the initial and final place. And so um, for that case, we get the original um, transition amplitudes. Let's call it curly F of X. See, that makes sense because this restricts to the trivial bundles, and for the trivial bundles, this is just the original state space. Could you specify again just what's the between the original P and the over X and P tilde over over X. Um, sorry, I changed my thing. Okay, I'm sorry. So this is F equivariant of P over X. Okay, and um, moreover, the automorphisms of this. Uh, P over X have to act as the identity on these transition amplitudes, and if you think through that uh, statement, you'll see that that's the general, that's the proper generalization of the statement that the amplitudes commute with the G action. Okay, so we are now ready for a definition. Uh, a field theory. F equivariant from this S sub G to that satisfying the above axioms is a uh, G equivariant extension of the field theory. And more informally, we have what we've done here is we've specified the coupling of the theory to external gauge fields or non dynamical, external or non dynamical. Once again, if G is gamma is a finite group, to specify a bundle is to specify a connection. There's a unique connection on that bundle. And so um, a gauge field is the same as choosing a bundle. In the general case, I should be saying everywhere, instead of G-bundle, I should be saying G-bundle with connection. Okay, so now let's return to our example. Let's see what this, what this uh, fancy stuff says about our nonlinear signal model. So, supposing we had our nonlinear signal, so we do example one continued. Supposing we have a nonlinear signal model, phi, based on fields, phi from x into some target space m with metric, with some metric. And m has a symmetry group g. So for example, the O3 sigma model is a model where we map into O, you know, the, S, the sphere 
the sphere has an isometry group. If it's got the round metric, it has the rough isometry group of SO3. You can try and gauge that. <coughs> what do we have to do? We have to enlarge our space of fields. Well, what we do is we consider uh, principal bundles over X, and the enlarged space of fields are now maps not from, from X into M, but from the principal bundle into M, which phi tilde, which are equivariant. Okay, so the new fields are phi tilde from our principal bundle into M, which are equivariant, which means that if I act with some a group element gamma here, then my map, by tilde, commutes with the gamma action here. That's what an equivariant map is. Now, if you think about it, ah, so for the trivial bundle, uh, this is, I've done nothing. So if P is equal to X times G, then to specify an equivariant map into M is the same as to specify a map into M. You see, because um, if I know phi of X times 1, okay, let's just call that phi of X, then the equivariance tells me where X comma G goes. So phi of X comma G is equal to phi of X dot G by equivariance, and so there's nothing more to say. Um, before I go further, uh, in general, if I have a, uh, a bundle, if I have an equivariant map over X, that is, in general, the same as to specify, I guess I'm using G instead of gamma, that is to, that's the same as to specify a map not into M, but in the quotient space of M by G, by which you should think of this as the isomorphism classes of um, M slash G. So this is, to come back to your question, this is a case where it's very good to use this kind of language here because these can be bad spaces and nevertheless you can start to understand uh, what this gauging of this sigma model is all about. How do you do this? You take an X here, you take a piece of X, okay, that projects to it, you take phi tilde a piece of X over here, and you project it down. Now, which piece of X did you take? Well, over X, there's a whole G torso, okay, so you might have taken two, two different ones. But those two different ones, because phi tilde is an equivariant map, death are by a G action, so there's a well-defined map into the quotient. Okay, so let me now make this even more concrete by considering the nice example of one plus one dimensions. Okay. So let's now be more concrete and specialize to one plus one dimensions. And then I think you'll start to see this formalism really starts, uh, really does, really does make sense. Okay. So I used X here. Of course, there's always a parallel story between X, the space time, and Y, the space. So here what I've done is I've, I've stressed the space, but of course um, similar things are true in, in, for the space time. So the space, Y is just going to be the circle, okay? Okay. So we're supposed to be associating in our nonlinear sigma model some H equivariant um, to bundles P over the circle, okay? Where P is a principal gamma bundle. Okay. 
Okay, I've been using G, but I really want to stress now that we're th talking about a discrete group. Okay, so now we're really going to start using properties of discrete groups. Okay. Um, okay, now how do we label gamma bundles over the circle? Well, you should all know that with the back of your hand by now, right? We've, we've gone over this a lot. So we know, for example, we know that we could go to the universal covering space and choose a homomorphism from pi 1 of the circle into the group. Right? So for each gamma in gamma, we construct the following bundle, piece of gamma, which is r times gamma divided by z over S1, where this identification here identifies S, a real number, and a gamma with S plus 1, uh, sorry, let me do it this way, S plus 1 comma gamma prime is identified with S gamma gamma prime. Right? So, if the generator of Z is this equivalence relation, I can quotient by this. The projection here takes the equivalence class S comma gamma, goes to say e to the 2 pi i s. The, the, um, the fiber over a point on the circle is just a copy of gamma. And the, the right action, the 6.3 right action, takes uh, S gamma uh, let me call it gamma prime. I'm labeling the bundle by gamma. The, the right action is, by definition, S gamma prime and the double prime equivalence class. That's a fixed point free right action of gamma. It doesn't, it doesn't interfere with the equivalence relation because I'm multiplying on the right. And if you go through what we said uh, before, this implies that the monodromy is gamma. That is, informally, as I go around the circle, if I start at some point and trivialize my bundle, okay, and I go around the circle, I'll come back, multiply by gamma. We've seen these bundles several times now. Okay, so, so concretely, we should be thinking about H equivariant of P gamma, and um, this is going to be the uh, L2 wave functions on equivariant fields. So our next task is, um, how do we think about our phi tilde, which goes from P gamma goes to M, is equivariant. And what is such an equivariant field? Well, if I have this phi tilde, okay, so remember, you know what equivariant means, I'm not going to repeat. Okay, so we have phi tilde from P gamma into M. Now I could, of course, pull back to R times, times gamma. So here I just have pairs. And so instead, I could talk about a map phi hat from r times gamma into m. It's a little easier to think about. And what are the properties of phi hat? Okay. So I want phi hat of s plus 1 comma gamma prime to equal phi hat of s comma gamma gamma prime. See, this property means that phi hat descends to a map of P sub gamma into M. Right, because this is exactly the equivalence relation I'm quotienting by to get to P gamma. So, so we have that. Now we want this thing to be equivariant. So we also want phi hat of S plus 1. Uh, that's a uh, misprint. In the notes, there's a misprint. It 
should say, phi hat of, I think it's a number, gamma prime, gamma double prime is phi hat of S gamma prime times gamma double prime. That's the statement that this phi tilde that it descends to, phi tilde is equivariant. You see, I've got right action here, turning into the right action on the target space manifold. So this is the equivariance condition. This is the, let's call it the descent condition, the equivariance condition. Okay. Now, finally, Now finally, let's consider phi check, which goes from R into M, where I define phi check of S to be phi hat of S comma the group element 1. Let's do a little calculation. So phi check of S plus 1 is phi hat, by definition, of S plus 1 comma 1. Now, by the equivariance condition, that is equal to phi hat of S comma gamma. That's this term over here, which is just saying that I've got a mop uh, from my bundle P gamma into M. Now, by the equivariance condition, that's phi hat of S comma 1, right action by gamma. But this was just phi check of S times gamma. So this is very important. This means that phi check of S plus 1 is phi check of S times gamma. These are called twisted boundary conditions. Okay. So what we've discovered what we've discovered is that um, in this process, we have to think about our equivariant fields from P gamma into M, equivariant. Okay, we started out with a, a one plus one dimensional theory. Uh, so we had a, a string theory where we mapped a circle into some space M, and then we gauged this G symmetry, this discrete symmetry, gamma symmetry on M. Then we had to include these, these bundles over our circle and take equivariant maps here. And what an equivariant map is, is a kind of twisted boundary condition where you start here and you come back and, when you, and it's not quite a periodic field, so it's not actually a function, it's not actually a map on the circle. It comes back to itself transformed by gamma. So I could imagine that if I drew M here, okay, I could now have um, closed strings, so to speak, which start at some um, phi of 0 and end at phi of 1 equals phi of 0 times some gamma. Okay. This is a picture in M. By gauging this gamma symmetry, I'm really now, as I said, talking about a, a, a sigma model where I'm really mapping S1 into M mod gamma. So this becomes a closed string in M mod gamma. Okay? And I really need to include those when I gauge the gamma symmetry. Okay? And so these H equivariants of P gamma over S1 are what are called twisted sectors. in the conformal field theory and string theory language. Uh, yeah, let, I think I'll come to a more natural, yeah, let me say one more thing. Okay. Yeah, definitely. 
Okay? So, so you see that when we gauge the gamma symmetry in a, in a nonlinear signal model, in a 1 plus 1 dimensional nonlinear signal model, we're led to these kinds of interesting string configurations, which are closed strings downstairs, but upstairs on M only close up to a group element. And the proper way of thinking about that is that what we're really talking about are equivariant maps on these bundles here, and we're, we should be talking about such maps because we're gauging a gamma symmetry. There's so many people who don't understand that. Okay, so let me finish by, um, by generalizing this a little bit. So I, I, I took a sigma model, I said some things about it, and then I specialized to one plus one dimensions so that I could talk about these very concrete bundles, P gamma, and, um, and then we discovered these twisted sectors. But in fact, what I've just said is rather general about um, one plus one dimensional theories. So this is, if you like, example two, the state space of general uh, equ gamma equivariant uh, one plus one dimensional theories. Okay, so what we, from our general axioms, for every gamma, P gamma over S1, we're supposed to have a space of states. Now, the, the one point I want to remark now, and we'll take it up, to take it, take this up next time. What I want to remark is that the p gammas form a groupoid, or rather, they are objects in a groupoid, as I've stressed where the morphisms, the invertible morphisms, are the bundle of isomorphisms. So what are these bundle isomorphisms? We can be really concrete about them here. Okay? So I claim that we can write an explicit bundle of isomorphism from P gamma 1, P gamma 2. Let's call it alpha sub gamma naught from P gamma 1 to P gamma 2 by simply taking, so alpha gamma naught, takes the equivalence class of S gamma prime, the equivalence relation in the set in the sense of P gamma 1, to S comma gamma naught gamma prime, the equivalence class in the sense of P gamma 2. Okay, you see, my equivalence relation here, when I defined P gamma, made a choice of this gamma. Now, this makes sense If and only if gamma 2 is gamma naught, gamma 1, gamma naught inverse. You see, you have to have this, this map well defined on equivalence classes. Okay. So this, these, this map is only well defined if this is true. But now, look what I've said. I've said that P gamma 1 is isomorphic to P gamma 2 if and only if gamma 1 is conjugate to gamma 2. Okay? And 2, the automorphism group of P gamma is equal to the centralizer group of Z gamma. So, that means that this groupoid, this is the groupoid gamma slash left gamma. The one where I drew the groupoid for S3. Remember? At the beginning of this discussion, I said, look, we're going to need groupoids, and we're going to need that groupoid of a G acting on itself by conjugation. What we've discovered is that these bundles here, okay, on a circle are a groupoid, and it's exactly this groupoid. So this picture I drew before, 
You see, this is the trivial, the, the one corresponds to the trivial bundle, S1 times gamma. It has all these automorphisms. Then I could make a bundle where I have monodromy, which is 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, and then there'll be various bundle isomorphisms. And also, those bundles will have some automorphisms, and so on. So that's the picture I want you to have. So, so now, you see, supposing I were gauging, and remember that there was a, a third isomorphism class. So now, supposing I were gauging an S3 symmetry. Okay. Then I would have one, two, three, four, five, six different state spaces. Those state spaces would have an S3 action on, on this, an S2 action on these guys, and an S, uh, a Z3 action on these guys. Okay. The state space here and here would be isomorphic, and that isomorphism would exchange this Z2 action for this Z2 action. And we exchange this Z3 action for that Z3 action. Okay. So that's what the equivariant theory is. Okay? So now I've told you, now I've told you and illustrated for you exactly what it means to couple to external gauge fields, okay, in the case of a discrete gauge group. Now remember, there were two steps in gauging a symmetry. One was to write the equivariant theory. And then next, we have to sum over the connections, the G bundles with connections. And in this case, with a finite group, everything's finite. So we can really talk about the sum very explicitly. So um, I think we'll take it up uh, next week on Monday. So I will point. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to explain the whole thing again for you. I don't need to. What I do need to do is tell you very carefully what a connection is. <laughs> so, so you mentioned that this is specifying somehow the coupling to it. That's right. In that case, so it, 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 all, I mean, everything I've said, I mean, that's why I'm taking I'm saying it at the earliest logical, logically reasonable opportunity to tell you what a gauge theory is. Everything I've said, uh, can be easily modified if you replace a G bundle by G bundle with connection. We know what morphisms between G bundles with connections are. You already know, so let me tell you. So you have a you have a P, you have a gauge field A. You know that A, you have some uh, with the Q, we need some gauge field A prime. Well, this A prime has to pull back to that A under the bundle automorphism. Think of it, think of A better. We have a globally well-defined one form, okay, with certain equivariance properties valued in the Lie algebra of the gauge group. Here we have a globally valued one form, like that, on this total, the total space of this principal G bundle. Well, we have some isomorphism. It's a bundle isomorphism, and therefore alpha star of theta prime, because it's a bundle isomorphism, will pull back to something with the proper equivariance properties here. If I go to local coordinates and write theta as g inverse d plus a g, okay, then um, in some local frame here and um, uh, h inverse d plus b h here, then my um, and my local coordinates, my bundle on automorphism will say g goes to g north h, something like that. And I'll find that um, A is equal to uh, B uh, gauge transformed by G naught. Okay, so I probably have some mistakes here because I'm doing this right off the top of my head. But when we come to this part of the course, I'll have the inverses in the, all right, in the right places. So in the group point picture, the different yep. island will be, in this case, the instance of um, Different principle. Um, no, no, no. In, in, the, in, the, in the case of a continuous group, um, the, uh, in the case of the continuous group, the different islands that you see here are the different points 
in A mod G, so there's sort of two sources of islands. There's a, co there's a continuous family of connections for a continuous group. Those are different isomorphism classes. They have different gauge invariant quantities. Then there's also the disjoint union over the different principal bundles, the isomorphism classes. One of the nice things about what I'm saying to you right now is that I'm disentangling those two, those two um, uh, sources of having different isomorphisms. Those continuous bundles, you say, is the gate in equivalent uh, connection. I mean, Pardon? For the same bundle. Those continuous bundles, you're saying, for this island, it's like the uh, in equivalent configuration. Yeah, so you should think of the, yeah, so each island here is an isomorphism class of a bundle with connection. Okay, now in the case of a continuous group, those isomorphism classes are not going to be a discrete finite set of points like we have here, but they're going to be infinite dimensional continuous manifolds. But they're also going to be components, which are exactly like these components. So you specify the companies like those. Well, say this is what you have to do if you really properly gauge a symmetry. You have to say what happens coupling, coupling to external gauge fields. If, you, if, you're, if you're coupling a theory to external gauge fields, you have to say what it is on every principal gamma bundle uh, and every principal G bundle with connection. So it's like those theta angle for this thing. Because for example, yeah, yeah, for example, absolutely. So you haven't, you haven't said how to couple the gauge fields unless you've said things are like theta angles, right? But that looks like the parameter for the gauge field itself. It's not Pardon? Like, that's theta angle or the gauge coupling is like the parameter for the gauge field itself. It's not like no, no, no. It's telling you, it's, it, 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 in my formal language, it's, it's telling you F equivariant of some P over X. It's telling you the transition amplitudes given a principal bundle over the cohortism from in to out boundaries. Okay. It's like with all the action, in, in, including the scale field action. The next step is some of this uh, cohortism. Right? This uh, the, with the next step, the next step we're going to sum over all gauge fields. We're not going to doing quantum gravity would be summing over cohortism. Oh, fine, fine. We're going to sum over principal bundles with connection. Yeah, that, that's the next step, and that's where the Yang Mills action comes in. Right. So I have to tell you how to sum over connect bundles with connection. No, I saw this from here. You said you specified the F and go. No, I think I, 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 think I answered it in a, in a somewhat confusing way. So you're asking, where does the theta come from? Right. OK, so that comes in in specifying how to sum over. That comes in in step two. I'm sorry, I think I said something wrong. That comes in in step two, where I tell you how to sum over bundles with connection. Now, if this includes, you know, uh, but, okay, so, if, here's, here's an example, you, it's close to what, what you're, you're asking about, I think. If I take uh, the best amino it in model, okay, in, say, four dimensions, so that has, that's a model uh, representing, uh, you know, chiral symmetry breaking, so this G would be in our chiral symmetry group, and we could try and engage it. And then there's something called the gauged Bessemino bundle. Okay? So you know, we have to add that kind of thing. But we might also want to gauge the Bessemino term, um, making sense of that is actually rather tricky. Uh, although it's known. I mean, that's the kind of thing I would need to do when I was specifying the coupling to the external gauge fields. Then, that's step one. That's making the equivariant theory. So I've enlarged my space of fields, but I haven't made my fields dynamical. Okay, so I don't need to know the yang mills action. Step two, sum over bundles with connection. Then you sure as hell have to know the dynamics of the gauge fields. Now you just work on that group point. The next step. So that will be summing. That will be saying how you sum over this group point, and uh, that's what I'm going to start with next time. We've now done step one for discrete groups. Next time, the first thing I'm going to do is say how to, what, what we do for step two, summing over the group point.